Hello, everyone. Welcome to our monthly Science of Alt Protein seminar. My name is Matt Hotze, and I'm the Director of Science and Technology at the Good Food Institute. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome to our community. The Good Food Institute is a nonprofit think tank, 100% driven by th philanthropy. And our goal is to build a world where, where alternative proteins are no longer alternative. If you're looking to take a deeper dive into the science of plant-based fermentation or cultivated meat technologies, check out our open access resources at gfi.org slash science. Now I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker to you. Dr. Rosalind Abbott is an assistant professor in biomedical engineering with a courtesy appointment in materials science and engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Professor Abbott received her BS and MS degrees in biomedical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and her PhD degree in bioengineering from the University of Vermont. She was subsequently a postdoctoral fellow in the biomedical engineering department at Tufts University, working under the supervision of Dr. Da or Professor David Kaplan, where she developed adipose tissue engineer models. Her lab at CMU focuses on tissue engineering and the role of tissue lipid accumulation in a variety of diseases and applications. And now I will turn the seminar over to Dr. Abbott, who will discuss how she and her team are bioprinting adipocytes into the transmuscular space to improve the organoleptic properties of cultivated meat. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, and I'm so excited to be here and to present our work to this community. Um, it's just a wonderful organization, and I'm, I'm just so thrilled to get any feedback that you have um, related to this work because it's fairly new for my lab. Um, and so I figured I would, I would kind of start with a little background about us um, and then go into the, the work that we've been working on. So my lab at CMU, as Matt mentioned, um, we like to consider ourselves engineering lipid-rich tissues. Um, and by that, um, we really started in the adipose tissue engineering space. And that, that started actually in David Kaplan's lab at my postdoc and then has continued at CMU, um, where we were looking at creating these models for regenerative medicine, um, for filling soft tissue defects, but also for looking at disease models. Um, and we've become really interested in lipid accumulation. And so in the fat, that, that being things like environmental factors or obesogens that cause you to um, accumulate more lipids than you normally would. Um, which has actually stemmed out into other tissue systems. Um, we've now worked in the fatty liver disease space um, where we've been developing fatty liver organoids and then de testing defatting reagents to improve um, the number of transplants that can actually be used. And this is what recently stemmed into this idea of looking at adipose tissue accumulation in the skeletal muscle space. Um, so it's, it's really kind of been driven by the adipose tissue, tissue engineering um, expertise and, and has stemmed into that. Um, and I want to start by first thanking the team that has done all this wonderful work. I'm just the excited one that gets to present all of their great um, their great progress. Um, and it really starts with Lindsay Huff, who is an excellent PhD student in my lab and who has really been the inspiration and the driver of us entering this space. Um, she helped me to get funding from uh, New Harvest and the Footprint Coalition, where we had over 60 backers um, that in a crowdsourced uh, funding campaign. Um, so lots of people supported this work, um, and that led to preliminary data that we then received an NSF Career Award for that just started last year. Um, and this is really a collaborative effort. So uh, we've been working with the Feinberg Group who developed the 3D printing technique that we have um, been using to print the adipocytes um, and really, there were three main members of his lab that really contributed a lot to training us and getting us up and running. And so I wanted to mention Brian and Neha, and then more recently, Sam Moss, um, who helped us to get really started and modifying printers and um, just having a lot of fun in this space. Okay, so why would we want to 3D print cultivated meat? Um, there's lots of different tissue engineering approaches in this space, and I think they're all really important. Um, but I think that, that 3D printing has its own contributions um, and should be considered in some applications. Um, it helps to provide texture. So um, recreating that tissue structure that, that tissues have in the body um, so that the, the meat product will recreate that, that tissue structure. 
Um, we think that it's really going to be helpful for cost, um, which is a, a big um, concern in this space um, because 3D printing will actually add minimal production costs, but really increase the price point of the of the final product from a, an unorganized matrix to a more tissue-like structure, um, which we think people will be more willing to spend more money on. Um, we also think it'll improve the reproducibility. Um, so if you're letting the cells self-organize, you're going to get inconsistent results. And so this is one way that you can try to really control where the cells are um, and, and really creating that structure that will be the same um, every time that you print it. Um, we also think this is really going to help with the taste um, because the intramuscular fat really adds a lot of flavor. Um, and so this is one way to, to place that fat in the proper place um, and so that you can have that palatability that you're used to with uh, normal tissue structures or, you know, uh, normal um, will hopefully change. And I liked how you said that at the beginning, Matt, that hopefully this isn't always considered the alternate um, protein space. Okay, so there are four ways that um, people usually print um, cultivated meat products or tissues. Um, and they all have their pros and cons. Um, so the first would be to print a scaffold um, and then see the cells after you print. So you're really just printing um, the scaffold material in whatever shape or geometry um, and whatever structure. Um, and then you would see the cells afterwards. And that's really where the field started. Um, and then another option would be to print stem cells and then differentiate the tissue after printing. Um, the third way would to be print cells, um, then differentiate those cells, and then self-assemble them. And so that's another technique that, that one group is actually working on. Um, and then the fourth would be to print already differentiated cells directly. So you've differentiated them in vitro, and then you prepare the bio inks, and you're going to directly print that tissue that will be used. Okay, so let's, let's step through the different approaches in this space. All right, so when you're printing a scaffold and seeding cells afterwards, the, the big pros here are that you're going to recreate that texture of the tissue, um, and you don't have to worry about cell-friendly bioinks. And so I think this is why the field started here, because for a long time it was very difficult to create cell-friendly bioinks that would cross-link into um, or create their structure as they were printed, because you need to have a, a liquid material that then has to turn solid with the cells in there. And so there's been a lot of progress in this field, um, and so now people can very easily print um, cell-friendly bioinks. The cons to this technique of just printing a scaffold and then seeding cells afterwards are really that um, you're limited by diffusional constraints. And so what I mean by that um, is that when you have a tissue construct that becomes too thick, um, the cells in the middle are going to be limited um, by their nutrient supply so that you're limited by how far nutrients can actually diffuse into that construct um, and also limited by the fact that waste products will accumulate and not be able to diffuse out. And so this distance is generally thought to be about 200 microns. And so if you're trying to grow tissues in a scaffold system, you need to make sure that there is a nutrient source within 200 microns. Um, so you have to have very thin tissues if you work with this approach. You also have to co-differentiate adipocytes with the skeletal muscles in this space. And so that means that whatever media is culturing both of those cell types has to cause some of them to differentiate down the skeletal muscle pathway and then some to differentiate down the adipocyte pathway. And actually currently there's no good system for this to, to just put one media type on a tissue and have it self-assemble into those discrete regions. So I mentioned the next um, way to print a cultivated meat product would be um, printing stem cells and differentiating the tissue after printing. Okay, so this is actually the most dominant um, way of printing adipose uh, tissue in regenerative medicine field. Um, and the reason why uh, stem cells are what everyone prints instead of actually printing the mature adipocyte um, is because it's really hard to print lipid-laden adipocytes. And so I put a picture here for people that were maybe less familiar with um, adipocyte biology. Um, and so these are the cells right here. And you can see that it's kind of outlined. And so this would be one cell. Um, and they can be anywhere from 20 microns, which would be a very small adipocyte, to up to 300 microns, which would be a very big one. Um, most, I think, are on this order of about 100 to 150. And so these are really large cells. And they have a single unilocular lipid droplet intracellularly that takes up almost 90% of the cell. 
So while they are huge, they are also fragile under shear stress because it's really got this one large lipid droplet. And then that lipid droplet makes them very buoyant, which you can imagine makes it very difficult uh, to print these cells because um, you're going to have a syringe um, that is printing downward and all your cells are going to float to the top. And so for these reasons, people have really kind of stayed away from printing these really large, buoyant, um, fragile cells uh, directly. And so instead, what they do is they will print, again, those stem cells and differentiate them afterwards. So I took a few of the examples that I that I like in the literature that there's quite a few more um, in the regenerative medicine space. Um, so here, um, this group, they 3D printed adipose derived stem cells and then differentiated them afterwards. And so another thing that I want to point out is that actually ad adipocytes take a long time to differentiate, usually um, greater than three to four weeks. Um, and then they usually have what are called multilocular lipid droplets. So they don't fuse to have that really big, large lipid droplet that I showed in the last slide. Um, and so yeah, this is them after about 14 days um, with this approach. I really like this approach by, by another group. Um, they um, printed stem cells um, that they would then differentiate into adipocytes with Huvex. And so this is towards a vascularized approach. And here they can really get um, these different regions of these different cell types. And so this potentially has promise um, for further applications as well too of vascularization is, is deemed to be really important for these approaches. Um, one other approach I wanted to, to point out in the regenerative medicine space was this idea of actually printing aggregates of stem cells. And so there are some people that will print spheroids, which is um, just a, a clump basically of cells that have self-adhered to each other. And so they'll print these spheroids um, um, using 3D printers, and then afterwards they can differentiate them. And so people do this for um, disease modeling, but also for um, different regenerative approaches, like I mentioned, with like filling a large defect. So this approach has been used in the cultivated meat space. Um, there was this um, uh, recent 2021 um, news uh, break that said ELF uh, farms ribeye steak is 3D printed, and so they don't give a lot of details, obviously, because they're a company. Um, but they, what they did is they they printed these cells, and then they got some some percentage of of lipid laden um, adipocytes that co differentiated with the skeletal muscle cells, although it's um, unclear how how much. So there's a lot of pros to this approach. So it's very reproducible, as I mentioned. That's one of the key reasons why you would want to 3D print uh, different tissues. It's going to have that texture. Um, but the problem, again, just as in the case of the scaffold that you print and then have to grow the cells afterwards, is that you're limited by the diffusional constraints of the cells. So you can't have a very thick tissue if you're going to grow the cells and differentiate them in their matrix um, to develop that tissue because you need them to have access to that nutrient supply. And so that's the same uh, disadvantage here. And again, that co-differentiation of adipocytes with skeletal muscles is currently a big challenge because you need them to go down those, those different lineages. So to try to, to um, get around some of those challenges, there was one group that printed cells, then they differentiated them, and then they self-assembled them. And so this is a group from Osaka University, um, and this paper came out in 2021. And here they're, they're engineering what they call whole cut meat-like tissues by the assembly of cell fibers using tendon gel integrated bioprinting. And so their approach was to print um, three different cell types um, and then differentiate them separately. And then what they did is they assembled them after the fact. So they printed skeletal muscle cells, um, they had adipocytes, and then they actually put some blood vessel cells as well into the into these different cultures and then and then reassembled them. Um, and so this is really good for um, maintaining that texture as in the other um, approaches. You're not limited by diffusional constraints because you're assembling them right before you're gonna freeze or eat them um, or prepare them. Um, and then you don't have that co-differentiation because you're separately growing all of these different cell types. Uh, the big con here, I think, is the reproducibility of the system because you're gonna have to manually assemble all the different parts. Um, and so they might be assembled differently. Um, and, and so that's, I think, the big con there. Okay, so the last approach um, is really the one that we've been working on. So here we're printing already differentiated cells. So the idea being that you could have two nozzles, a dual nozzle, 
um, printer where one nozzle is going to print the skeletal muscle cells and then one's going to print um, the adipocytes or your fat. And so they're already differentiated at this point. Our inspiration, very much like the Saka group, um, is Wagyu steak. Again, I mentioned I am a huge fan of lipids and lipid accumulation, and this is a very lipid-rich tissue, so this was where we wanted to start. Um, Wagyu steak is supposed to be a very buttery uh, steak that's got a, a very good flavor profile, um, and so we wanted to, to start with this. And so what's really interesting about uh, Wagyu steak is that you find adipocytes, and these are these green, um, green cells right here. You'll find them between the muscle bundles and also within muscle bundles. So you can see here some um, within those muscle bundles. And so this is the, the structure that we would like to recreate, where you have both adipocytes between bundles and also within the bundles. So why Wagyu, um, besides this fact that it's very lipid rich and it has this beautiful marbling that, that everyone um, is, is very excited about, um, it also has a high omega-3 and omega-6 uh, profile, which are um, fatty acids that are actually supposed to have prevent against heart disease. They're the good fatty acids. Um, so while it's a very fatty tissue, it's the good types of fat. Um, and so we're hoping that because this is such a high-end meat product, that this will help to improve consumer acceptance of cultivated meat products overall. And so starting with this very high-end structured lipid-rich tissue, uh, maybe we can get some people to, to buy in that maybe wouldn't otherwise. Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, this is going to help with the cost. Uh, so there's been predictions that cellular agriculture products can be about 250 per pound in the next nine years. Um, and Wagyu currently is anywhere from $50 to $400 per pound. Um, so we think that this is, is more doable um, as far as what consumers would be willing to pay, that they would pay a little extra to have this recreated Wagyu structure that, um, that everyone wants. Okay, so the printing method that we're using is called FRESH. Um, and FRESH stands for freeform, reversible embedding of suspended hydrogels. And so what's really great about this method is that there are two hydrogels. Um, so you have one hydrogel that's going to be the support bath. And so this uh, support bath behaves um, like a solid when, with low shear stress. So if you're not moving around, it's gonna behave more like a solid, but at high shear stress, it behaves as a liquid. So you can move the needle very quickly in and around this space. And wherever you print something, it's gonna hold it in space. Um, because there's not going to be that shear. So um, wherever you print um, in that space is going to hold it. Um, but it, yeah, again, it's going to allow that needle to, to move around. And so you can print really soft structures that normally couldn't be layered on top of each other um, because it's held by that bath until it's all done printing. And so here I can show you um, a print. So this, again, was developed by Adam Feinberg's group at CMU. Um, his, his group has been really helpful in teaching us how to do this. I mean, so you can see here that they printed CMU, which again, you wouldn't be able to normally print a C or, the, or even the M or the U um, with normal um, bioprinting methods. Um, but that support bath really allows you to print these softer structures. Um, and then I, I don't know if you noticed, maybe I'll play it one more time. At the end, what happened is that that bath melted um, and that was when it was raised to 37 degrees C, which is uh, the body temperature. And so when you raise it up yeah, right here, they're raising the temperature up. Um, you can see that that bath turns into a liquid and then you can release your prints from it. So FRESH really allows for high fidelity prints of complex tissue structures that wouldn't be able to maintain that shape um, if they were printed in air. And so the Feinberg group has printed all sorts of different structures. Um, they've done heart valves. Just recently they had uh, printed a whole entire heart um, from, with this method out of alginate, which is the material we're using, so that surgeons could practice on geometries of specific patients. Being That's the goal of the, printing the whole heart. And so you can create really large, detailed constructs using this method. So our fresh approach um, has been, again, inspired by Wagyu. So we started by imaging a Wagyu steak. Uh, we used an MRI so that we could segment out lipids and skeletal muscle. And so we'd have a blueprint um, for printing our tissue construct so that it would recreate that very distinct 
um, muscle bundle, intercellular, or intermuscle bundle, um, and between muscle bundles. Um, and so, so we have this MRI scan. Um, from there, we had image segmentation to separate out the fat um, and the skeletal muscle, and then um, we converted this to a G code. And when I say we, I mean Lindsay. Lindsay did all of this. <laughs> She's but again, I get to be the one that shares all of her exciting work, um, and she's been really working hard in this space. Okay, and then from there, the idea is that we will expand and differentiate cells. Um, so we'll um, differentiate our adipocytes before printing, and we'll um, differentiate the skeletal muscles uh, cells so that we print them directly. We'll suspend those into alginate, and that'll be our bioink. It'll be the cells and the alginate. Um, we'll load them into the syringe and print them. Um, and then just as it showed in that video, we're going to raise the temperature up to 37 degrees C, which is going to cause that bath to melt, that support bath. Um, and then it'll release our tissue constructs. Um, and then you do wash it um, to get rid of the, the slurry is what it's called. So here um, is our, our bioprinting of adipocytes. So we wanted to start first, um, again, because adipocytes have not been printed in the mature form in the field. Um, and so that's where we've started. Our research is really focusing on printing the adipocytes. Um, the Feinberg group has been developing methods to print skeletal muscle. And so that's something that they're working on and then we'll merge them together, hopefully soon. Um, but, but so far this update is really about printing adipocytes. And so here you can see, this is our bio ink um, where we made it so that it's such a cell dense solution um, that when you print it, you're not gonna have the cells floating up because it's, it's very, very cell dense. And here you can see, this is a print and this is what the density looks like. Um, so what we've been working on is optimizing these outcomes. Um, so trying to push the limits of the cell density with the bio ink. Um, adjusting the viscosity with our alginate percentage. Um, and then a big thing that you can adjust in, in bioprinting is the needle gauge. Um, and so whether we, we have a larger needle gauge, which would decrease the resolution um, and trying to optimize how, what sort of needle gauge we can actually uh, use to get the, the resolution that we'd like. Um, and then also the printing speeds, because ideally you want it to print as fast as you can, but you don't want to make sure that that doesn't harm the cells. Um, and some ongoing experiments right now that um, we don't have the data for yet are the infill density. So all of the experiments that I'll show you were actually fixed at a 50% uh, infill density. Okay, so as I mentioned, we were trying to adjust the cell solution because we want it to be as much cells as we can get, um, but you still need that alginate, which will be cross-linked in the bath um, to create that structure. So you do need to have some of that material. And so the, the best, that we can do really is 60% because when you go above that, um, you lose the integrity of the print. Um, and so this is the percentage that we decide to go with um, being the 60% cell solution in the alginate. Um, because again, we're, we're looking for structural stability at this point. Um, and uh, when you adjust the alginate, so the next thing that we adjusted was alginate percent. Um, and so here, uh, we, we ranged it from 4%, 6 8 10%. And you can see as you created a more, um, more concentrated alginate solution, what actually happens is that the cell size decreases. And so this is a dynamic thing that adipocytes do. They respond to their environment um, with their cell shape. And so if they're in a very stiff environment, there has been uh, research that shows that they are, uh, they, they'll decrease their size. And so this happens very quickly. I don't think anyone has shown that it happens this fast. Um, basically, while it's suspended in that alginate, we think that that's when the cell shape is is changing. But we're doing experiments right now to actually see if that phenomena is, is the case or whether it's the shear through the needle. Um, but we found that, that cell percentage or cell diameter is actually really largely affected by the percentage of alginate. Um, so we decided to go with 6% because we do want to have large adipocytes. Um, as I showed you that Wagyu picture, they're, they're really large adipocytes. Um, and so this is the, the percentage that we went with. Next, we adjusted the needle diameter. So as you increase the needle diameter, you're actually gonna increase the adipocyte size as well, the, the adipocyte diameter. Um, and so you can see here needle gauge, um, or again, uh, a lower needle gauge is gonna be a higher 
um, needle diameter. Um, you can see that the, the larger the needle gauge, the larger the adipocytes we get. So we decided to actually go with 18 gauge um, for all of our subsequent studies to just allow those adipocytes to be as large as we can get them. Um, next, we looked at print speed. Um, what's good is that the print speed does not affect the morphology, so we can really print very quickly and the cells um, maintain the same uh, cell size. And adipocytes, it's very easy to tell if they are not um, uh, intact. Um, so you can see that they, they maintain these really large um, lipid-filled morphology that I was showing you before. is really characteristic of those cells in vivo. So next I mentioned um, that we took an MRI scan um, so that we could segment out the fat and the skeletal muscle and we could create this blueprint so that we could print um, in the, the intramuscular space exactly how it is in the Wagyu steak. And so here you can see this is the CAD model. Um, and so we're using this to create our dual nozzle printing um, with Fresh, which um, we've just been playing around with printing um, dyed gels, uh, dyed alginate, to, to really make sure that we recreate that structure before we start using different cell types. And so that's the stage that we're at right now. So we have these dual nozzle printing parameters. Um, Lindsay's been working on, on trying to print them together. Um, and so this is still a work in progress right now. We also um, tested the Wagyu for mechanical properties. And as you can imagine, um, it's a really soft uh, material. And so we're using this as a, a benchmark for how we will say whether we have achieved a similar structure um, in our Wagyu prints. And so this will be the elastic modulus that hopefully we'll, we'll optimize too. Um, and so that this is a, a compression testing and then also the rheology, so a shear test. Um, we think both of those parameters are really going to be important for making sure that we recreate um, the same uh, properties, the same feel, the same texture um, of these meat products that people are used to. Um, and I will say that uh, I've never eaten Wagyu, actually, because I, I don't eat beef, um, but that it's a very buttery um you can just tell looking at the structure. Um, Lindsay said that actually when she worked with it at room temperature, it almost like melted in her hands and she had to move into the, the cold room. Um, so this is gonna be uh, an interesting structure to recreate. Um, and the, these mechanical properties really tell us that it, it has these uh, very soft parameters. Um, so I will say that so far what we have been doing is printing with human uh, adipocytes because we are, um, again, our, our background is regenerative medicine. And so we have a large supply of human tissue. Um, so all of those uh, preliminary results were done with human cells just because they're readily available. Um, and we of course have um, ideas for using this for regenerative medicine as well as a, as a defect filler. Um, so right now we've actually just gotten cells from David Kaplan's group, um, immortalized bovine satellite cells. So we are working on differentiating the adipocytes um, and the skeletal muscle cells so that we can start printing with bovine cells. Um, but we're also open to, to collaborating with others and trying other cell types too, um, because I don't think this approach has to just necessarily be limited to bovine cells. Um, but with the inspiration of Wagyu, this is really where we're starting. Um, and so, so happy to talk more about cell types as well, because um, we've basically been really focused on the, the 3D printing aspect um, so far. Okay, so our approach, I, I mentioned pros and cons of all of the other approaches. Um, so a big pro of our approach is that we're going to have that texture, right? So we're, we're making sure that we're basing it off of Wagyu steak so that we have the same architecture of the fat skeletal muscle. Uh, it'll be reproducible because we will be pr printing directly into the bath and then hopefully we'll be able to use that construct right away um, as opposed to trying to self-assemble and put it together um, manually. In our approach, co-differentiation is actually not required because we're going to differentiate those cells beforehand into the adipocytes and then into the skeletal muscle as well. Um, but, but a con, you know, uh, would be potentially the cohesiveness because the cells are not um, developing together in the tissue. So this is something we're not sure of yet, um, whether they'll actually form a tissue-like structure together. Something we've thought about is, is rigor mortis required to create that, that stiff tissue. Um, so these are, these are things that we're thinking about um, as we're moving forward and trying to make sure that we do create that tissue structure. 
Um, and there's definitely different strategies we can we can employ to increase the cohesiveness if it's required, but um, this is a potentially con of our approach. The other thing that um, often comes up when we're discussing this project is whether we need vasculature. Um, so if you were to print this directly and be able to use it directly, then I don't think you would need the vasculature. But if we do need it to have some sort of cohesiveness between the cells or communication between the cells is required, then I think we need to start thinking also about incorporating um, the vasculature so that you can allow it to be in culture for a little bit longer um, and have the larger size, which is what we're we're going for, because we do want to create a full stake eventually. Of course, right now we're, we're working on small mini models of it, but because you can print these directly, we're not limited by diffusional constraints, so we can create really thick tissues if that's what we want to do. Um, and so these are some of the, the things that we're thinking about moving forward. So uh, future directions and things that um, I'd love to talk more if people are excited or interested in talking more about them. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, do we need to let the cells mature after printing? Um, if so, uh, how long is required? Um, oh, this should have been in this next one. Um, can we add flavor into the support bath or even the bio ink? And so we'd love to collaborate with people that are thinking about flavor um, and whether, you know, that is in the bio ink or is it in the, the actual bath? Maybe you could print into something that, that has some sort of marinade or um, uh, I don't know, different ideas are more than welcome. Um, something that I'm very excited about, I mentioned omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are really prevalent in Wagyu steak versus other steaks, is tailoring the lipid content to really improve the nutritional value of different cultivated meat products. Um, and so that's that's something that I, I'm hoping that we can do in the future and hopefully something that we can recreate in our tissue constructs. Um, yeah, different cell sources, so, so whether it's bovine, um, or some other cell source if people are excited about a different type of um, cell that they'd like to try bioprinting we're, we're really excited about that as well um, it's not something that we're actually exploring so we're, we're looking for collaborators in that space um, bacon this is one idea that Lindsay had other tissues um, other meat products um, we're more than welcome to try to do the same thing where we create a blueprint um, adjust our g-code and then and then just uh, tailor our output based on whatever the tissue is. Um, so we're, we're excited about uh, different collaborators in that space too. Um, I did also want to mention uh, that we are working on um, co-differentiation of adipocytes and skeletal muscles. I told you that I'm really interested in lipid accumulation and lots of different tissues. And so skeletal muscle is a really interesting one. Um, it does happen in the cow. It happens in humans. It happens in endurance athletes. They accumulate lipids in their um, uh, like uh, in, into their intermuscular space. So it's definitely a phenomenon in both disease and in, in actually high-performing athletes um, where they, they get these, these lipids um, in the skeletal muscles. So it seems like something we should be able to do. Uh, so we're working in this space. And so hopefully we have more coming soon um, towards one of those other approaches that I mentioned where co-differentiation is gonna be so important where you have one media type and then it causes the differentiation of both the adipocytes and the skeletal muscle. Um, and so while right now I think there's not a lot in the literature, maybe there's more in different companies or maybe they've discovered more that um, is not shared yet. Um, but I think that this is an area that potentially we should be able to figure out as bioengineers. Okay, um, thanks so much for your attention. I guess I did go a little bit short, um, but questions are more than encouraged. Uh, and then, yeah, happy to chat and get feedback and, and uh, yeah, learn more. Thanks so much again for having me. Thank you, Professor Abbott. Uh, really appreciate the talk. I think there's been there's been a few questions that have come into the Q and A box, and I would encourage others uh, to use the Q and A box if they have questions. I'll just go in order of kind of where they okay. appeared in the presentation, if that's okay for you. Yeah, wonderful. First question uh, would is: Are you able to reuse the support bath gel media after melting it, or does it need to be disposed after one printing? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I know Lindsay and I have talked about this, uh, and I can't exactly remember what her answer is. I think the answer was no, but there's potential maybe to reuse it. Um, and so I think right now no one is reusing them, but I think it's something that in the future we could, because it is a material. Um, and it, it basically, I, I could have put a picture in it's just all these different, like, 
small little balls and that's basically how it holds everything in this space and so i think there is the potential but i might be i might be um overly hopeful <laughs> so um, that's a good question uh, but right now we are not and i i know the fiber group is also not for using their support baths thank you um be probably be important for the environmental impact in the long term but yeah yes. yeah for yes. sure yeah uh, so the next question is about the nozzle diameter effect, um, yeah. where you see that the cell diameters decrease with the nozzle. I, I, I think the nozzle, uh, as the needle diameter goes up, the cell diameter also goes up. Right. Um, so larger it, size, they, larger they, sites. Yeah. Yeah. So they say in some images, the cell density seems to be lower. Have you checked for yeah. cell disruption and the presence of lipids in the alginate matrix? Yes. So, yeah. So, actually, we're doing some mechanistic studies right now to determine when this happens. Um, but we do see more debris um, in the smaller um smaller diameter. I get confused with gauge and you got to keep it straight, but um, so yes, we do see more. So I think going smaller would lead to a more inconsistent result um, where you didn't have those intact adipocytes. Yep. Thank you. Um, the next question that, that uh, popped up here is if you were going to, I think what the, the question asker is just asking, what at this current technology level, how long would it take to print like a I guess a normal size stake. Yeah, so I think um, so. We've been printing, or the goal is to print like a centimeter um, cubed. Um, so far, that's our like first baseline, and then we'll scale up. And I think that it was about an hour and a half. Um, but it depends on a lot of parameters um, as far as cell speed. Um, so it could be adjusted. Um, so it could take a, a while to print a full stake. And I'd have to check because I know that the the Feinberg group, or maybe you can go check the, the literature yourself too. They printed a whole heart. And so it would probably be on the same scale as how long it took them to do that. Because I think that's about this, maybe it'd be a little bit smaller than that, but you could look for the time frame of that um, as well. I think you wouldn't want to rush it though, because again, you can result in, in potentially lysing the cells. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So uh, next question is um, one concern with extruding some plant proteins is an oxidation process that adds a grassy slash bitter taste to the scaffold. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's a similar concern with the alginate? I don't know. And and someone actually asked me if I had tried to eat alginate before. Um, and I <laughs> actually haven't yet tried that. So I, I'm not sure. And I wonder what the phenomena is that causes that, whether it's um, disruption of the protein. Um, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. So that's definitely something we'll, that we'll have to look into. Thank you. Um, next question <laughs> is, without uh, without the blood, how do you recreate the bloody, uh, meaty, uh, the question asker says metallic taste of, of beef? Oh, see, this is what I'm, I'm wondering how much it does contribute. So that's something that we have talked about, whether... Um, whether we are going to need the vasculature and mostly we're thinking more like, I guess, bioengineers and whether it's needed for perfusion, but it, it very well could be that taste. Um, I know that people have, have put heme proteins in, and I think that's more for like the color, um, but that's maybe something that we should think about too. And we're not opposed to trying to print in vasculature as well. Um, and there have been people that have printed vasculature as, as far as regenerative medicine goes. So I think if that is important, that's something that we'll, we'll have to explore too. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in is, is coloring needed to make it appear more like meat? Mm, I mean, I think people are used to, to, to whatever color food stuff that they eat. I think that it probably is important. Um, I know they've done studies with kids and whether if it's brightly colored, kids are more likely to eat it, but we're all kids at heart. So I'm imagining that there's a, definitely a, a percentage of our population who's going to want to make sure it's the right color. Um, and I think they even do that, you know, when they, they do those like impossible burgers, they make sure that they look the right color, right? So I, I do think that that is an important factor um, just for subconscious uh, experience. Psychology. Yeah, right? yeah. I think so. But otherwise, I'm sure it doesn't, I'm sure it wouldn't taste anything. 
different no but but we are a product uh, of what we think so <laughs> yeah what is it like presentation on the plate matters right it's like half the experience yeah. of eating right um, so yeah yeah so yes, something like that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so next question from from daniel um if the bath gel holds the hydrogel in place have you tried different orientations for the nozzle geometry if possible could you have multiple nozzles printing into a single scaffold yeah so so we do do two nozzle printing right now um where you have um both nozzles and usually what you do is you would print that that single layer and then pull it up and then you'd print the other one into that layer and then you would go up and so you'd kind of be going between the two nozzles so it is possible to print with two two bio inks right now it's i'm sure three as well if you i mean we haven't done that uh, but if you needed the vasculature, I'm sure you could probably have a third one in there too. Um, but yeah, yeah, with the support bath, you could maybe, but you got to go from the top down because you need to hold it in place. Um, so it's not like you could kind of go from the side because you need a container. Yeah, makes sense. Um, the next question, I'm going to kind of take some liberty with the question asker here. Okay. So it looks like they're they're asking about the differenti differentiation time of adipose cells versus muscle cells. But oh, yeah, yeah. Um, from what I took from your presentation, right, is that you're already they're already differentiated when you're when you're printing them, or at least that's your intention. Right. Um, any other detail considerations about differentiation time? Yeah, so they are right that adipocytes take much longer to differentiate than skeletal muscles. So I, it would just be a matter of timing, I think, that you would probably start the skeletal muscles later or they'd be ready faster. So, um, yeah, you just have to do that pre-timing um, a little bit better or plan for it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. I think that is all the questions we have in the Q and A. Um, okay. And if anybody would like to to add any questions, uh, now's the time. <laughs> oh, here, I did here see we go. Some things pop uh, up that were like, "Oh, I've tried alginate. It's it's not so good." <laughs> <laughs> well, there there's a there's a sort of a general question about the texture, but I I you know you mentioned that you haven't really tried this yet. So yeah. maybe not the, you're going to get there eventually. Uh, and right, it looks right. like you've been studying the, the, the beef, you know, the, the, the material properties of the, the actual beef to try to match that right, uh, right. eventually. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and as I mentioned too, we just got bovine cells. So, the, you know, we've been working with human cells and there's no way we would have tried it yet. Um, but once we, Oh Yeah. But once we get to the bovine cells, um, I, I think, you know, it, it, we're, I, we've had good luck with the skeletal muscle differentiation. We're still working on the adipose tissue differentiation. Every species is a little bit different. Um, so, so we're still optimizing for that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, next question from Bao Jin. It says, in your opinion, what will the basic cost for a piece of cell-based Wagyu meat uh, be with 3D printing? Well, kind of a general I, question, but I think you mentioned uh, that Wagyu was 50 to $400 a pound, right? Yeah. Currently. Yeah. yeah. So there's a good range there. <laughs> you could, you could fit it. I mean, I don't know if you could quite go to the same level, you know, but, um, I'm sure you could charge more for it than you could, for example, if it was like a ground, um, burger, you know, something like that. So I'm not sure. i I'm an engineer. I'm I'm not I would not be making the price <laughs> point for that. Um, but I'm I'm hoping that we could get within that range. And there are those, I'm sure this community knows those techno economic analyses that say it's gonna come down out of price. So um I would trust them more than me um, for what price yeah, it would be. And I, <laughs> you know? and I think it entering at a higher price point is probably a, a pretty smart idea. I think that there's some uh there's definitely companies looking at, at for example, like high-end sushi yeah. tuna sushi right that's a place right. where you can actually compete same general idea yeah um cool um the next question is are there have have you considered the environmental impacts of your study so i guess this is kind of building on the hydrogel question right, um right. waste streams media sourcing um any intention to do to look at like what this would look at like at a full scaled out you know 
Wagyu yeah, yeah, production it, facility? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, we haven't, we haven't, um, we haven't looked into to those sort of factors yet, um, but I'm hoping that it would be better. And that's a big motivator for why we want to do this too, yeah. um, as probably most people, right? Um, I will say maybe not what they were asking, but something that we're thinking about is how um, contaminated meat is already. Um, and so trying to control, you know, different like, um, like PFAS, for example, from entering the food um, or from mm. the, the packaging and, and how this could actually be um, a lot better potentially as a meat source that would have less contaminants just because it's more of a controlled environment. And so we can maybe reduce the amount of fluids that are in it. Um, and so that's something that we've thought about. Um, but no, we haven't like optimized our media or um, yeah, we're, again, we're just kind of going down that road um, for differentiating mm -hmm. them, but it's going to be an important consideration. And and yeah, maybe we need to figure out a different bath or modifying our bath so that we can reuse it and print into the same one. Um, so that's definitely going to be something that we we talk a lot about and we're going to work on. Well, maybe maybe saving you some money in your research costs before yes. uh, <laughs> right. before getting right. to the environmental footprint yeah. part. And certainly, there's uh, yeah. plenty of engineers at Carnegie Mellon that would be uh, excited to work with you on something like this. If you ever decided to do a uh, like a TEA or uh, yeah. LCA oh, yeah. of this uh, yeah, yeah, process. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. In the right place for that, for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, As you know, we've it, spent some time here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great people. Um, it, next question is, is there any environmental concern about cultivated meat? Like, just, so basically the question is around this whole uh, genetically modified uh, uh, food. Um, have you done really any thinking about that or have, you know, your, when you give this presentation, maybe to more yeah. of a general audience, how, how has, how have folks reacted to that? Yeah. So I, I think that, um, yes, I think it's a super important question because in order to not be continually getting the cells from the animal to, to make it more minimally invasive, which I think is really important for a large base that would be eating this. Um, they'd want to make sure that you minimize livestock impacts. And so having a cell source that's going to proliferate um, without having to go back to the actual animal is going to require that they're immortalized. Um, and so I think that that is something that's going to be needed for this field, especially to, to decrease the amount of animals um, that are impacted. Um, and I think that it's going to take a lot of talking to people and making sure that they understand that, you know, eating something that has been genetically modified doesn't genetically modify you. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that that's going to be a big part of, of educating consumer. Um, yeah. Consumer mm -hmm. acceptance basically is going to need to be surrounded by that. At least that's my opinion. I think that it is probably going to need to be a mortalized cell source, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing as long as we can somehow educate the general public that that is an okay option. Makes sense. There's a lot of potential opportunities for collaboration uh, with your lab. That's excellent. Yes. Yeah, um, please. Yeah, please contact me if you're interested in any aspect of it. So we love collaborations and um, yeah, we'd love to work more with all the people in this in this community. So yeah, get in touch for sure. Wonderful. Thank you again. This then, has been so fun. And thank you for all the great questions that are just going to keep us thinking about new directions and new things that we need to need to work on. So thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, everybody. Thanks yeah. for thanks for joining. And thank you again, Dr. Abbott. That was wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Matt. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay.